Hello everybody, I'm Bill Harris, your host for Life Questions, and welcome to the program. Today, as always, we will be addressing your questions about life's issues that many of you have sent us. We'll be getting the answers straight from the Word of God and ministered to you by guest pastors. We have assembled a panel of local ministers to review and research your questions to provide answers from a biblical perspective, and I want you to meet this panel. We begin with Pastor Jim Stafford of Trinity Evangelical Church in Upper Sandusky, followed by Pastor Tim Smith of St. Mary's First Church of the Nazarene. Next, Pastor Tim Benjamin of Wayne Street United Methodist Church, St. Mary's. And rounding out our panel is Pastor Charlene Williams from New Life, New Life Church International here in Lima, Ohio. And we welcome you all to the program today. Happy to have you. Thank, Thank you. you for having us. All right, well, one of the questions that we have received, and I, I could anticipate this question at some point, a question from a viewer wanting to know why Christians are being persecuted so much. And I think we ought to broaden the scope because it's not just here at home, it's international. And it's, it's also within <coughs> the home, within the home setting, um, where people don't, uh, where, where people are Christian, become Christians, I should say, and are not understood by their family members. But in general, why, why do you think, why are we under persecution? Well, I think part of the reason why uh, people face persecution as, uh, as intently as they do is because, first of all, we were promised we would. So, I mean, it shouldn't really be a shock that uh, sometimes people are not accepting of people who want to uh, come in line with Christ and try to live to a higher standard. Uh, a lot of people that makes uncomfortable because it, it has a air of judgment about it, even though I'm not sure judgment, in fact, I am sure the judgment is not the intent. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is, is that other people who feel convicted by that don't respond positively to it. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that we as, as followers are trying to be convicting to other people, but people will look at us and say, well, you, you've got something I don't have and, and it's not fair. And, and sometimes that will create a situation where people respond very negatively to something that's actually very positive. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think what's key too is what you said earlier at the very beginning and that we were promised yeah. that we were going to be persecuted. Yeah. 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 I, I yeah. think part of the reason is uh, we bring it on ourselves as believers sometimes because sometimes what we say and what we do it doesn't measure up mm -hmm. and that brings a lot of questions to people's minds um, that we are we are saying we're believers we're saying we're Christians but our lifestyle and our attitudes and our actions are not measuring up mm -hmm. and I think that creates yeah that would create problem mm -hmm. uh -huh. it's just natural wouldn't it <laughs> it would it would you're absolutely right and certainly here <coughs> The question of persecution in our country is very different than in other Absolutely. places around the world. Yeah. So to be careful that, that we keep in mind the level of persecution yeah. and yeah. certainly to pray for other believers where in other parts of our world it's illegal, dangerous to the point of risking your oh, life yeah. to be a believer. Yeah. Yeah. So though it's certainly a place to keep in prayer for mm -hmm. believers who yeah. are persecuted beyond what we can even imagine within our culture today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, th I think also sometimes uh, life is just hard and sometimes people, the Christians experience problems and persecutions and they think it's because they're Christian. It's just because they're experiencing what everybody Absolutely. experiences and uh, it's not necessarily, sometimes it's very clearly because we're following Christ and sometimes it's just because that's, life is difficult. Yeah. And, it's, and it's not about being a follower. Yeah, we sometimes forget that even non-believers and people who are not following Christ <laughs> tend to have bad days occasionally too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah. And also, if you look through the New Testament, it was persecution that spread the gospel. Yes. It was persecution that caused the gospel to be infiltrated into so many other arenas. Um, and I'm not sanctioning persecution at all. No. Mm -hmm. But I think it comes with life. And I think our perspective on it helps us to navigate it better. Because yeah, certainly Jesus it. added that we'd be blessed. Blessed are those who, per who are persecuted mm -hmm. for his name's yeah. sake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to some degree, that time of persecution should be an encouragement to believers yeah. to know they're being faithful yeah. to following yeah. our Savior. Mm -hmm. I think the moment we see it like we are victims. That's when it's a problem. That's when it yeah. becomes an issue. Especially if you, you are... Um, you're not conscious of the fact that this is, this is life. It's just life. We live lives for Christ, and these are some of the, the normal outcome of life. 
But if I see because someone said something about me, I'm being a victim, then of course it becomes a negative feeling. But as Christians, it's, it's going to cover the territory. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not Christians, it's still going to cover the territory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And in some countries, of course, is you're taking your life oh, in yeah. your hands right. to uh, announce that you are a follower of Christ. So it, it's yeah. come to that. Yeah. And uh, as you said, it was promised. Mm -hmm. It's been prophesied. Uh, and, and even in Latter-day prophecy, it, it talks about mm -hmm. those who turn to Christ will be persecuted. Well, there's not, a, there's not a single biblical example of anybody who was a follower and everything was hunky-dory after that. I mean, there's not one. And, you know, certainly people like Paul who were, who were honored to be able to make such sacrifices and go through such persecution. And, you know, he was in jail converting the, the jailers and things like yes. that. But I, I think... Uh, that, that we get the idea that, you know, as soon as we start following Christ, everything sort of gets in a line and is perfect, and there's just no precedent for that at all. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying, there's an old uh, phrase in the kingdom that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, when, and that's why the persecute, we're blessed when we're persecuted because it can bring others to faith. Also, would you say that persecution um, helps to build character, mm. helps to build integrity, helps to give you a, a, a foundation, helps you to discover who you are in God? As situations come around you, um, it's going to either melt you to see if you're really who you say you are or not, mm. because it is through that persecution that you're your strength comes forth. Who you really are mm -hmm. comes out. Well, it's always always when somebody wants to share a testimony. Yeah. Nobody ever starts a testimony with, you know, I was at Cedar Point and it was awesome. And oh, I, right. that, that's not how testimonies start. It's always persecution. Yeah. It's always a bad time. It's always something going on because it's in those moments that we figure out who we are. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen. Let, let, let's turn our uh, attention to something that, that's closely associated with that, and that is that. Um, being misunderstood by family members can lead to persecution. And sometimes, as you said earlier, we, we can bring that on ourselves. And, and at other times, there is just a, a natural resentment because perhaps <coughs> we are showing ourselves in, in a way of, of good character that someone else does not embrace and they feel threatened by that. Uh, do any of you ever, ever experience that at all? Where you, you're I, misunderstood by family? I grew up in a home where I was the first to be saved in my, my generation, mm -hmm. my family. Um, I came from overseas, Georgetown, Guyana, huh. and the gospel had just reached our country. And so we were accustomed, we, were grew, up, we grew up Anglicans and Catholics, and so to introduce Pentecostalism was, mm -hmm. it was, it was so derogatory. It was not accepted to clap your hands and worship the Lord outside of what you were accustomed to. It was, it was horrible. And so my parents did not accept it. Really? It, hmm. was, it was some of the most difficult years of my walk with God. But that's when I said character is built. You discover who you are. It was in those years that I found prayer was, is everything because you, 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 you find yourself drawn close to God because that's where your source is. Mm -hmm. That's where your strength is. So, and as a result of me fighting to keep my integrity, when I discovered that I can draw from God, every single member of my family are now saved. Really? Pastors and leaders have come out as a result. So, yeah. That's it's wonderful. Not, it's that not is, all bad. That's, that's <laughs> great. That, that is excellent. Anybody else have anything <coughs> you have to add to that? Yeah. Nothing to add to that? Okay. Well, um, another question here we have. Um, this question, I, I, it, I struggled about this question, but I think we, we probably ought to deal with it. Somebody writes in to ask, why did God allow my brother to die? You know, yeah, I, I sense that when a, when a pastor or minister is asked that question, sometimes it, it almost nails them to a wall because that's quite a question. And, and it seems that no matter what you might answer, it may not really be sufficient. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, that question is real in the lives of people. How, how do you address that? How do you deal with that when you ask something of that nature? 
I think certainly you're allowed to ask the question. I mean, I think I encourage people to know that's a natural reaction. When, mm -hmm. when something bad happens, if your brother has died, you're gonna wanna ask that question. And on the other side of that, I don't, I don't have a good answer. Mm -hmm. And so I, I tell people, I can't tell you why, but I can tell you that God is with you in the midst of it. And while that doesn't answer the question in the moment, it assures them as they go through that grief or that pain or that loss that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. And we find testimony out of it. We find where God can bring some sort of word of hope or encouragement to us. But I've never been able to find a, a question that satisfies the pain that that question comes from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it, it would seem that perhaps the best answer you could give is what you said, an honest answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm rather than trying to conjure up something that you think might make the yeah. person feel good and they can see right through it. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. said that at a number of funerals. Uh, I've said, you know, this, this, you know, we're here today to celebrate the life of this person. This may very well fit into God's plan. There may be something wonderful that comes with this, maybe some kind of disaster that was averted. But I today, in this moment at this funeral, I'm not in the mood to try to guess what that is. And I don't think that's my role as the pastor is to try to say, well, here's the explanation. It's going to make this all okay. Because I, I don't know that that ex Even to say this person has either avoided something terrible or something good may come from this or somebody may encounter the Lord because even if all that's true, mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure that makes me go, oh, well, I'm just glad this happened because I don't, I don't know if that answer exists. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, the uh, ultimate answer is because sin is in the world. You know, it goes back to Adam and Eve and introduction mm -hmm. of sin. And since we've all participated in sin, everybody's going to die at some point. And so, again, it's, it's a matter of life. Why a specific individual dies at a specific time and people seem to die at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, we certainly have no yeah. answer. Yeah. What is the right time to die? There is no right time to die. Yeah. Um, and so, again, you just offer the ministry of presence and know that God loves you yeah. and God loved this brother that passed away as well. And, and in the greater scheme of things, I think this also illustrates, and, and, and I, whoever asked this question, I mean, this is something that everybody feels, is we sort of misunderstand the purpose of prayer. We think, hey, I prayed about it. Why, did, why, why was this averted, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we miss that prayer is about us connecting with God, not, you know, having the genie jump out of the lamp and start granting wishes. That's not what prayer is for. Yeah. So uh, prayer is about making us okay where we are rather than fixing all of our problems. Okay. And I think yeah, we're going to take a break. And uh, when we return, I want to deal with a very basic, fundamental human struggle, struggle that is. And that is the struggle of worry. Mm -hmm. Worry. Mm -hmm. okay. We'll deal with that. Perhaps you're worried about something. You want to stick around. We'll be right back. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back. But before we get into the discussion on worry, Pastor Williams, you had a comment you wanted to make about the previous question when we were talking about the issue. Someone wrote in asking, why did my brother die? How, yeah. you, how, you, how yeah. you respond to yeah. that? I looked at a, 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 bibli a biblical perspective of a story that occurred between Jesus and some of his very, very best friends. Yes. Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Great followers. And they ask that, that question when their brother died. It's almost like we called on you, we prayed, we interceded, we, we sent a message to mm -hmm. you, and you didn't come. It hurt, mm -hmm. it hurts, it is yeah. disappointing, it is frustrating, mm -hmm. and we see Jesus grieved with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that touched me because no matter what our griefs are, no matter what our, what our pains are, and our questions, sometimes we don't understand. But it's comforting to know the Father is there. Mm -hmm. He is there through the process. He was there all the time. He was there in the New Testament mm -hmm. with Mary and Martha. And he always ends up by saying, 
even though we don't understand it, we, we turn to the Father who understands everything and trust him. And I think that's the gist of what Jesus was saying to his friends, that through the difficult times, through the painful times, be assured, know for sure that God is there. Whether, he, whether you can see him evidently, tangibly or not, he is there. And that is the comfort I want to give to that family today. You may not understand everything, mm -hmm. but just, just pour it all like Jesus himself screamed and, 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 and Mary and Martha cried. That's the comfort we have in him. Excellent. Very good. Very good. And, and, and that, that takes a, quite a bit of faith, does it not? To yeah, trust in yes. the Lord even when you can't see the results, even when you don't have your expectations mm -hmm. met, and you're still trusting. Very good. Well, let's carry that over to a conversation on a similar struggle, and that is the struggle of worry. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have a propensity to worry. They just worry about ev every little thing. And, is worrying symptomatic of a person feeling that they're losing control and now they have to worry because they, because they don't have control? You think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the anxiety of our world today with the technology and the repetition of bad news is more overwhelming than it's mm, ever, been. ever been before. Yeah. And in fact, I was recently reading that on Amazon in the Kindle, they track mm. what people underline. And, and the most underlined verse is Philippians 4, 5, be anxious for nothing, nothing. but in nothing. everything, yeah. by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, bring your request to God. Yeah. And I think the fact that we go to that verse and underline it as we read it, <laughs> whether it's a paper Bible or your electronic Bible, speaks to the need of that particular wisdom and subject mm -hmm. in our world today. Hmm. What can worry left unattended do to a person? Oh, it blooms into anxiety and then it causes all kind of problems because normally when we're worrying about something, it's something we feel, pow feel powerless about. You know, we, we don't worry about, you know, tying our shoes or things like that because we can most, for the most part, do those kinds of things. So we don't necessarily worry about them. We worry about things we can't do anything about. So it's this kind of uh, experience of continuing to be keyed up about something we're never going to be able to solve. It's always going to be there. Until which is something futile, happens. isn't it? Yeah, absolutely futile, it. which is, I'm pretty sure why Jesus said probably shouldn't do that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, not, not recommending worry because it doesn't add a single hour to your life. And, and it's true. We actually know now medically it's the opposite to take hours away. And yeah. I just think that a lot of people spend a lot of time spinning their wheels over things they can't do anything about and they expend all the energy and then they miss opportunities of things they could do something about because they're worried about things that, that may or may not even happen. Mm -hmm. the, there's, again, there's an old saying that uh, uh, worry is like a rocking chair. You know, it doesn't really get you anywhere, but it gives you something to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, Jesus does command us not to worry. And I think, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said uh, the issue is control. Uh, we feel like we need to be able to control something. And when we, when we recognize and, ac and acknowledge and submit to the sovereignty of God, that he's in control and he can put things and people and situations in the right places, then there can come a victory over it. And certainly Paul's words tell us what we can do is pray. <coughs> yes. And I think, you know, if it's important enough to worry about, yeah, it's important yeah. enough to pray about. Good. And that's Good. really, I think, would turn a lot of worriers into prayer warriors mm -hmm. if ah. we took all those things we worried about. <laughs> and every time that worry hits us, said this is a chance to pray. You know, the, the, Max Lucado says that the presence of worry is unavoidable, but the prison of worry is optional. Mm. Say I that again. Well, I, I, the, the, the presence of worry mm -hmm. is unavoidable, mm -hmm. but the prison of worry is optional. And I Love think that. that ability to say, you know, all of us are going to face anxieties, but to, to say, God, I'm going to turn everyone over every time it comes, I think, again, is a continual work of the church and our spiritual life as Christians to live into that commandment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. Good. Well, James, the book of James even tells us that we don't have because we don't ask. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the same thing is that we don't, we, we have these things we're concerned about, but like you said, we never... It never goes any farther than that. We never actually go to the one who could actually do something about it. We just decide to hang on to it and be concerned about it to the point that drive ourselves crazy. There's another question that came in from uh, a viewer. We have only one God. 
Why are there so many denominations? <laughs> <laughs> well, for the same reason, we only have two feet, but we have a lot of different uh, shoe companies out there as well. <laughs> they all do certain things differently, and, and, uh, but they're all trying to accomplish the same thing, and that is you know, care, for, care for the feet. I think churches are the same way. There's a lot of denominations out there that will, will emphasize one part or, or uh, not emphasize another part, and I think that's because uh, the Holy Spirit has a way of adapting the gospel to fit a lot of different situations. And I think the different denominations are different ways that that spirit manifests himself so that we may be able to uh, experience God in a variety of different ways in a variety of different places and accommodate a, a variety of different people. Mm -hmm. that. Yours, is, is, it, is it independent of a denomination? Your it's been part of the Assemblies of God. Assemblies of God. church is an independent church, oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Well, what would you have to say to that question? Um, I think God has made man. It's just amazing the bigness of our God because he has made man with our minds to choose. And I feel like man has, there's certain propensities we have. So I might read one thing and I find something in that and you read and you find something different. And so I think what is happening is as people read the word of God, they emphasize more of what they're interested in. So you might be interested in the Holy Spirit and there goes your denomination that you start off more with the Holy Spirit or whatever. But I think all of us are trying our best to serve God mm -hmm. and to obey his word and to live. Now, not all of the denominations are biblical either. Right. So we do That's have true. to consider that. Yeah. yeah. Very good. How about this side of the... Uh, Richard <laughs> Foster has written a book, uh, Extremes. I, love him. I, I can't remember the full title, uh, but basically he, he takes all of the denominations that exist and kind of groups them into six different groups and calls them different streams. And his imagery is that uh, each of those streams is necessary to come together to create the river called the church. And uh, it's, it's a really neat imagery to help us understand what what God's overall purpose is in having different different denominations. Mm -hmm. yeah, when we do the Apostles' Creed at our particular service, we have a line that says, we believe in one holy Catholic church. Yeah. And every time yeah. I get people who come up to me and tell me, but we're not Catholic, and yeah. I try to explain to them, we believe that Catholic means all believers in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is different than a, the Roman Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or Protestant churches. I think the goal as believers is to have that unity that Christ calls for. And I think there's recognition that sometimes the world sees those different denominations as division. Yeah, yeah. And the real message in, in that question, I think, would be to try to communicate that we do see each other as all yeah. part mm -hmm. of the one church mm -hmm. that one. believers of yeah. Jesus Christ are a part of. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you a question now that we, we didn't get from a viewer and uh, we had some time left. And uh, I've been reading a little bit about this, and that is uh, an increasing number of ministers committing suicide. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what a serious problem yeah. that is. What in your own estimations is it that a minister deals with today that could lead one to the point of self-destruction mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. And I don't ask this condemningly. Mm -hmm. I, I want to get the heart of it to help any pastors and ministers out there that may be contemplating suicide. It's a very, uh, being, being a clergy person is a very demanding job. And I think, uh, I mean, not knowing any, not saying any specific reasons, but I think a lot of the time this runs into a lack of self-care. When you're trying to you know, save the whole world by yourself and you forget that Jesus already took care of that, mm -hmm. you, you try to run out there and do everything yourself. And I mean, I'm sure that there's others around this table probably have fallen into that time or two, I know I have. And uh, once, you, once you try to push past burnout, uh, you end up in a place you don't want to go. And I think a lot of uh, our clergy sisters and brothers have found themselves in that dark place. And that's it's a hard place to be because you're trying to bear the weight of the world and we, weren't, we were not designed to do that. And you may not get to that dark place until you're actually there. Huh? Yeah, or re realize you're going there until you arrive. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Wow. And I think many times to um, back up, I read a, a little quote that says, when a minister finish, finish preaching a Sunday morning, it's like he's done 20 hours of work. Really? That one service 
is like 20 hours of work. Because so of if the he giving had, out. There's so much of giving and the preparation is so much involved because you want to make sure that you're in contact with the Father and you want to make sure that you're ministering his word authentically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when a minister is just giving and giving and giving, many times they fail to do that self-care. If you drive your car without filling it up, mm -hmm. yeah, and we all as ministers, we neglect ourselves many times and our spouses and our families to help, to save, to minister, just like you say. Running to around help, on empty. Yeah, running mm -hmm. on empty, serving on empty, ministering on empty. And yes, it's going to catch up with us. Yes, I've been there. And it, you, 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 you go so far and then you can't go anymore. And so I encourage pastors. My heart is really grieved over this matter because mm -hmm. I've seen so many ministers and so many ministers wise that have packed up and walked away from the gospel, mm -hmm. walked away from church just because they're like, I'm finished, mm -hmm. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And then when they don't feel that sense of appreciation and they don't feel that sense of of worth and what's not coming maybe from outside because mm -hmm. you sometimes you don't feel that peer camaraderie between mm -hmm. you and fellow mm -hmm. ministers you don't feel that trust so that causes you to be alone you don't you, you how can i trust you and tell you that i'm struggling and that's one of the problems too interesting yeah. mm -hmm. either of you have anything to say about that well I, I, as you said ministering is a uh, emotionally taxing yeah. and it's it's not uncommon for myself and, and I'm sure other ministers as well to feel extremely drained on a Sunday evening and that's why a lot of pastors take Mondays off yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you just hit, hit an emotional low yeah. Yeah. and if you haven't done that self-care to, to refill um, it you, you you end up in a place you don't want to be yeah. you, you hurt yeah. yourself scary place yep. and certainly that encouragement to find that counselor or mm -hmm. that support yeah. group or that person to help you if you're watching today to know there's plenty of folks to reach out to yeah outside outside of your local congregation yes. Yes. Your, your particular local congregation yeah. Yeah. right well i'm going to have to wrap it up with that we're all out of time thank you very much well, we, oh, we have a minute left yet well let me, let me say this then i think uh it's important to understand that standing there to minister behind that pulpit is not like somebody just merely standing behind a, no. a desk to give a lecture no. right. or a speech, is it? Right. Mm -hmm. It's no, not the same no, thing. No, no. And uh, that's, that's not what's being weighed into mm -hmm. the thought process here when we think about And this actually goes back to the question we started with about the persecution thing, not to, not to say that we're persecuted, but the, the message is not always popular and it's not yeah. always well received. Yeah, and, exactly. and we know that going in and sometimes there's some risk involved in that and sometimes it comes back to burn you. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll let it go with that. Thank you yeah. very much. Interesting insights. Appreciate you very much. Well, thank you for being with us today. Certainly hope that the Lord has blessed you in some aspect of this conversation today. We'll be back again next week. Until then, I'm Bill Harris. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>